So you're in hell today uh, for the second time. Um, Dante's Inferno, class two. It was my pitiful attempt at humor. Uh, not damnable, but, but not close, not far off. Um, as I said to you last time, in the second canto, we begin the Inferno proper because we have the invocation of the muse. O oh, muse, O oh, high genius. Um, which marks every epic poem. I said this is an epic poem. It's of a different sort because the understanding of what happens after life uh, changes radically under Christianity. And so does the purpose and meaning of life and the orientation of life. The orientation of life is towards God. It's towards heaven. So it has an eschatological uh, sense to it, which is there in Virgil, but it's not clearly defined in relation to a person the triune Godhead, but that's the orientation of Dante and um, the connection with the underworld though. We now have hell full formed. Uh, before we had an underworld, now we have hell. Those that are in hell are those whose sins have taken them there and who have not been redeemed. They are all in hell. And Dante is going to go down there and show how the various moral failings that bring people uh, to because of their sin to death and to the second death um, end up being where they are and that's part of his journey uh, we're, so we're going to look at book two here very briefly uh, I think I mentioned a little bit of this but actually I've already gone over book two let me go to book book three here uh, and that should work it I think that's it it is it and the Mandelbaum translation I said last time, oh, there you go, better, that we were going to go to the gates of hell. These are the gates of hell and the famous lines, abandon all hope ye who enter here, translated by Mandelbaum in more contemporary English. But on the, on the hell is presented as a city, an infernal city. Uh, we saw this in, in Virgil as well. There was a reference to uh, a city underneath uh, where the damned go. Um, Dante picks that up and uh, does so with a bit greater scriptural warrant insofar as the, uh, at the end of all things, we're told there are two cities. There's the Babylon the Great and we have the heavenly Jerusalem, both, both cities at the end of things. But here it is the a city that is the gate of the damned, the suffering city as it called it. And so, uh, a repetition here. Well, let's look at the beginning. Per me, per me, per me si va ne la città del dolente, per me si va, etc., per me. And then, dolo, dolente, dolore, gente, fattore, podestate, amore. And again, the terza rima throughout. But through me, the rep repetition here, the anaphor at the beginning, through me the way into the suffering city, me, through me the way to the eternal pain, through me the way that runs among the lost. Justice earned on, er, urged on my divine artificer, my maker was divine authority, the highest wisdom, and the primal love. Note that the gate, that hell was constructed because of justice. Uh, this is a bit of a surprise perhaps, I don't know if it surprises you or not, but the explanation for hell uh, is, is that it was created, it came about as a consequence of sin. Didn't exist before that. Sin created hell. Or rather, justice created hell, which was a response to sin. What is going to be the, the consequence of Adam's sin in the garden? Hell. We're told that sin um, will be the consequence of disobedience and and. Uh, sin will lead to death, but we're not told the form of the death. The assumption might be that it's just physical death. In Christian doctrine, that's just a sign of a far worse outcome. Because we're moral beings and bear the image of God, there's, there's more at hand than simply the cessation of bodily functions, which we normally mean by death. Or when I say we and normally, I'm talking about our um, the atheist naturalism that permeates the modern sciences today. They don't see 
any more significance to a person's death than they do of the death of a, an amoeba or a cat or any other creature. It's just the bodily functions have stopped. That's what death is. And um, I think if that were the case, we would not feel devastated at the loss of somebody. And we would not be afraid of our own deaths. And we would not uh, believe that there is, uh, that life ought to be preserved. We wouldn't think that killing somebody was an atrocity. But everybody knows that, that death has more meaning than simply the cessation of bodily activities, everybody. And the way in which you die would also be, would not be accompanied by all the things that are associated with a bad death, with an evil death. Person is run through from behind, killed like a traitor. Well, what's the difference if it's just the cessation of bodily activities? It's, it wouldn't be any different. But we're, we're aware that there's a moral significance to death and life at all times. And Dante expostulates on this and expands on it and says that, that hell itself was urged on by a high artificer, well, God himself created hell as a consequence of mankind's original sin. It was not there in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. No mention of hell. No mention. It arises afterwards. And as a consequence, and as a moral consequence of a moral act or an immoral act, there's a moral consequence. And so the, the sins that are going to be meted out will be uh, the consequences of immoral actions. And there are different types of immoral actions. Oh, stop it. And they are uh, designed here in terms of uh, different types and categories of love. Uh, it, so the surprising thing is twofold. One, that justice creates hell. And secondly, that justice, that sort of punishment for injustice is associated with love. Those things don't normally get connected in our associations, that we don't associate love and justice, particularly with the punishment. Doesn't seem like a very loving thing to do. In fact, this is one of the things that is said about Jesus. If Jesus was all loving, then why would he send people to hell? seems rather cruel. And the answer is because that, that in, in God, love and justice are united. And there can be no love where there's not justice. God would not ensure that, that he was acting in conformity with his character if he allowed injustice to persist. So if people who were murdered did not receive their just deserts, we would not regard God as just or the universe in which he rules as very loving. But there, those connections are, are there. And so there are varieties of injustices done against God. But Augustine, Augustine, Dante follows an Augustinian framework in, direct, in presenting them as forms of love or disordered forms of love. And in the upper uh, regions of the inferno, we have or uh, disordered loves in accordance to incontinence. So uncontrolled loves. So in the second circle, we'll find the lustful. So people who desire uh, men and women out of lust, seeing them out of the, in the wrong order. In all of these things, uh, we need to keep in mind what Augustine calls the ordo amoris, the order of love. I don't, whoa, boy, that was close. Try that again. Jesus is love divine. As he creates all things, he creates them to be good. He also creates them in accordance with his own nature, which is loving. And there is a hierarchy of loves. Uh, loves point to Christ. They're normed by Christ. What does loving mean? Well, you can't even understand loving without understanding who Christ is. But the other things are like signs of love or pictures of love. 
for which reason they tend to be idolized in the world that we live in. So love itself, romantic love, tends to be idolized. We sing songs about love, pop songs, we, read, we watch movies about it, we read books about it. Um, we think about it. We think about love. We think about all sorts of love. Um, C.S. Lewis talks about four different ones. He talks about familiar love. You know, we can even love a certain season of the year. We can love a favorite armchair. We can love a certain type of food. We can love our dog. And that's a familiar love. We can grow pretty much to love anything that can be familiar, but that's a sort of love. We really feel uh, attached to, to objects, familiar love. It's a very low form of love, but it's still there. And then there's th that thing that the ancient world particularly prizes called friendship. That's a sort of love you, uh, that adds great richness and meaning to your life. If you have friends, friends give you a sort of love that's not like familiarity. It's not your family. These are people you choose to love. And they tend to be people that are like, that share your interests. Those are friends. They look at things the same way you do. Those are the people you have as friends. And you can add as many as you want to that group. You can have a lot of friends. And the number that you add to the group does not um, diminish the friendship that you have with other people. Other than in one sense, you, you might be spending less time with them. Because if you have a thousand friends, you can't spend as much time as you if you have one good friend, right? but you can add to them and nothing is lost in the process. That's a type of love. Uh, Lewis mentions a third, romantic love, eros. That's an exclusive love. And it's love wh where it has an object. In friendship love, you don't look at your friend and love you. You stand shoulder to shoulder and look at something else. In romantic love, you look at what you love. And it's exclusive. There's a sense of ex exclusivity there. In scripture, it speaks about God's love in something like that because it speaks of the love of God as uh, he's a bridegroom and the, the church is the bride. It has that sort of exclusivity to it. Although there, it's not exclusive as far as the bride contains all the people of the world. But still, there's a, it's a particular choice of love. But then there's the love that norms them all, which is the agape love, where the object of love is, does not deserve any love, but gets ultimate love. It's seen at the cross. God loves something that's unlovable, uh, totally unlovable. There's nothing, there's no merits in uh, the people that God loves. How do we know that? Well, he calls them sinners. It's a contradiction of his character. They don't deserve his love. He gives them his love, even to the point where he lays down his life. That's a different type of love. That love orientates all these loves. So when the incontinent loves up in the upper uh, levels of hell are described as incontinent, it's because they're directed at, or they're not kept in the right order. Remember, God's love ought to be first. Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment is, and he says it's to love the Lord your God. And then the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says it's like it and it's one, but they're in a right order. You have to love God first. That's the order of Morris. Love, the love of God is the, the utmost love and it always has to be preeminent in every relationship, including marital love. But here they've got things out of order and they are incontinent in them. So we're gonna find in the, in the fifth canto, the second circle, the lustful, um, it describes adulterous relationships. They, they love a, someone romantically, which is not in and of itself wrong, but it's misdirected and it's, uh, it's not in control. This is where many people fall. And it's the easiest one. It's, it seems closer to being right. It's, it's a little bit more like God's love. Whereas ones at the bottom, like treachery, that doesn't seem anything like God's love. As we go further and further down into the inferno, we're going to find it's more and more difficult to be sympathetic to the people who are being punished because we will regard them as bad people. Whereas the people who fall in love with the wrong person, we're pretty sympathetic to that. We don't regard them as bad people, but they are actually bad people. They don't love God first. They don't 
follow God's laws, right? They commit adultery. They betray somebody in the process. Uh, anyway, so the, the incontinent are there in the first uh, five circles, the violent in the second, and the fraudulent in the third. In the case of fraudulent, they combine a disordered love with a uh, manipulation of truth. Remember, false teaching is the most harshly judged in Scripture. It re we read in the New Testament repeated warnings against false teaching. And the reason why is because you, with fraud and false teaching and fake news, you can deceive a whole nation. A whole world can be brought down through false teaching. If I kill you, I kill you. I might kill an individual, might be a father and a mother and consequences there, but the whole nation is not brought down in the process. But if I deceive the whole nation or the whole world and bring them all down in the act, then I've done a mighty thing. And at the bottom of the of Inferno, we will find uh, it's, it's the area called Judeca, marked by Judas Iscariot. It's presented as fraudulent and a betrayer. But in the third canto, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. In the third canto, it just talks about on the gates of hell before he goes in. And it says, abandon every hope who enter here. Well, why don't they have any hope? Because hope comes with faith and love. At the end of 1 Corinthians 13, these three things abideth, faith, hope, and charity or love, but the greatest of these is love. There is no hope for people who are caught up in their sin and are out of order with things and are not, are not covered by the blood of the lamb, which is the shed love of Jesus for the sinner. If they are not that, they are hopeless. They are, they've lost hope. In hell, no one has hope. That's what led them there, actually. It's not a consequence of being in hell. It's the effect that leads them there. They have no reason to live, no higher reason. They've just seen, looked at themselves, and they're not looking for anything greater than that. But that's the warning on the gate, and these words, their aspect was obscure. I read inscribed above a gateway, and I said, Master, their meaning is difficult for me. And he to me, as one who comprehends, here one must leave behind all hesitation. Here every cowardice must meet its death. For we have reached the place of which I spoke, here you will see the miserable people, those who have lost the good of the intellect. Now, this is a funny way of presenting hell, the good of the intellect. It sounds abstract. It sounds a little bit too rational for us. What he means by this is they have lost all orientation, all sense of goodness, all sense of just uh, judgments. They're totally disoriented. They're totally lost. They, they can't think straight. And that's because they've lost sight of God. God is not here in, in the underworld. He creates hell, but he is in no way represented by what he sees down here. And I, I mentioned to you last time, and I'll get to this a little bit later on, the uh, description of the cir various circles of hell, he gets from Aristotle's ethics. He's not getting this from scripture. He's quite plain on that. So one of the questions that's always asked is, uh, whether Dante is following scripture in his description of the underworld, because I call this a Christian epic, and the answer is no, not when he comes to hell, not at all. He's not, and he's explicitly not doing so. He's quite plain about that, other than the fact that he calls it hell. And those who are in hell are those who did not profess faith in Jesus, so in that sense it's Christian, but the actual uh, discrimination between the different types of sins that lead to different layers within hell are not from scripture. So if you're upset with Dante about that, don't be upset with him. He's not claiming anything that uh, would offend on this front. It's an imaginative way of looking at it based on, as I say, Aristotle's ethics, where Aristotle will, from the world's perspective, see certain sins as better or, or more understandable than others, and I've already given the case which you would agree with, 
that it's easier to sympathize with people who fall in love with the wrong person than it is with somebody who betrays their entire nation or their Lord. I think we find it easier to be sympathetic to the first people and we don't see it, them as quite as bad, right? And so we say, well, it's, it's mean of God, it's wrong of God to punish people for that sin, but of course he would be right in punishing them for, for violence. Well, we sort of get that. Violence, oh, that's wrong. We condemn all violence. Okay, from the world's perspective, these, these two uh, layers, uh, the, the fraudulent and the violent, it, those are easier to condemn from a worldly perspective. From God's perspective, from Scripture, all sin leads to death. All sin. But from the worldly perspective, which he gets from Aristotle, we see the things the way Dante does. It's very easy to see it. Hard to disagree with him, in fact. Entirely reasonable. So the condition of hell comes from rejecting divine love. The sinner rejects divine love. He rejects the atonement of Jesus for his sins and as a result ends up in hell. So in the inferno is actually a part of a redemptive universe. To be redeemed, you have to be redeemed from something. You're redeemed. God is saving you from his judgment. That's what redemption is. That's what's that's what redemption is. It's salvation from God's judgment, his just judgment. So uh, here in this canto, they come to the realm of the, uh, first of all, we're in limbo, and then we come to the lustful. But here we first encounter the uncommitted, those who made no choice between good and evil, including it seems the angels that didn't choose between God and Satan in the war in heaven. Dante seems to suggest that there are them, some who sat on the fence. He sticks them in the top of hell. That's a funny old place, as the uncommitted. Um, to get there it, from the vestibule into the first circle, they have to cross the river Asheron, which is one of the rivers in the underworld from Virgil and also from Homer. It's called Asheron River. They have to cross that. And um, at first, we meet a figure whom we've already met by the name of Sharon. I identified a few. I saw and recognized the shade of him who made through cowardice the great refusal to choose sides. At once I understood with certainty this company contained the cowardly, hateful to God and to his enemies. So everyone hates the people who won't get off the fence. Yes? I'm curious why Dante put the indifference above the Because to me... This is from a worldly perspective. It's not, from, it's not even a Christian perspective, I think, here. Yeah, you're right. Oh no, well those are different, but these are th those aren't the ones that he hasn't got there first. Those will be in limbo. Yes. They're not in limbo yet. I'm curious why, in, in my opinion, they should be blocked the other way. Because? Because it's the same to me as, um, a greater offense to not decide anything. Yes. And just didn't know any better. Yeah. yeah. I think you have a reasonable case. I find it a little bit complicated why he why he presents things exactly the way he does. Um, but this company, the un, the indifferent, contains people who can't be moved one way or the other to choose good or evil. Even the the evil hate them as well even though they're useful to the evil because they don't stand against the evil. But they're, det they're detestable to everybody who basically drift through life and are incapable of making, standing on every side and basically out of cowardice. Just too afraid to be moved one way or the other. And he even says these wretched ones who never were alive went naked and were stung again and again by 
Horse flies and by wasps that circled them. The insects streaked their faces with their blood, which mingled with their tears, fell at their feet, where it was gathered up by sickening worms. Okay, nice. Um, <laughs> then they go along and they see the river Asheron. And the river Asheron, let me do this because it starts to jump over. Um, and they go and as they do that, they go towards and they see an aged man, hair white with years, was shouting, woe to you corrupted souls. Forget your hope of ever seeing heaven, in case they couldn't read. <laughs> Uh, I come to you to lead to the other shore, to the eternal dark, to fire and frost. And you, approaching there, you living soul, keep well away from these. They are the dead. So he sees Dante and says, you don't get to come here. You just stay away from that crowd. They're coming here. You don't get to go down. My guide then, Virgil, Sharon, don't torment yourself. Our passage has been willed above where one can do what he has willed and ask no more. He doesn't need a golden bow. Remember Virgil needed the golden bow. Aeneas needed the golden bow to get to the underworld. Also part of the divine will. Now the divine will doesn't need a golden bow. It's just if God wills it, he can will it. And it's been willed, so you just do what you're told. Slap, give Sharon a slap and on you get out of the way. So now silence fell upon the woolly cheeks of Sharon, pilot of the livid marsh, whose eyes were ringed about with flame, wheels of flame. Sharon is presented here as a demon. Not so in Virgil, but here as a demonic figure. But all those spirits, naked and exhausted, had lost their color and they gnashed their teeth as soon as they heard Sharon's cruel words. They execrated God and their own parents and humankind. And then the place and time of their conception seed and of their birth, they curse everything. They curse God, they curse their parents, they curse humanity, they curse the time and place of their birth. They curse, they curse themselves, they curse every aspect of their own existence. All the way back to Adam. And they blame everybody else but themselves. There's no repentance, there's no desire... It, they express what we just heard. They've lost the good of the intellect. There's no awareness of uh, their own guilt. They're not going to recover it. This is not a place where you, uh, you're not in a learning environment here. You're in a punishing environment. Then they had foregathered, huddled in one throng, weeping aloud along that wretched shore which waits for all who have no fear of God. The demon Sharon, with his eyes like embers, by signaling to them, has all embarked. His oar strikes anyone who stretches out. And as in the autumn, leaves detach themselves, first one and then the other, till the bough sees all its fallen garments on the ground. Similarly, the evil seed of Adam descended from the shoreline one by one when signaled as a falcon called will come. So they do move across the darkened waters even before they reach the farther shore. New ranks already gather on this bank. He gets this directly from Virgil. Reference to birds, reference to leaves. The dead are like leaves, the dead are like birds. In the autumn, they flocked south. Big, you see the big um, Canada geese forming in a line going south. All over in the northern hemisphere, same signs of death. Uh, regularly used, so when you read about leaves in literature and about birds, it should make connections. There will be all sorts of other connections as well, but, but there we go. So down we go, and uh, Virgil says, My son, those who have died beneath the wrath of God, all these assemble here from every country, and they are eager for the river crossing because celestial justice spurs them on so that their fear is turned into desire. Now, this is the interesting thing. They love hell. This is one of the things that's missed out in um, discussions of hell, is that it's not just that they're condemned to hell, they want to be there. There's something in about justice that makes the loves within them love evil. They want to be evil. They want the, the nothingness of goodness that's in evil. They desire it to be there at the same time as they're cursing. There's contradictions here, obviously. Why are they cursing something that uh, they seem to desire? Yes? Do 
to call good evil and evil good? Yeah, I'd turn you over to your desires. That's right. Give you what you want. But effectively, in terms of disorientation, the loss of the good of the intellect, it's to say, evil be my good. And good, you're evil, I think. So to totally flip them around and regard evil things as something that you desire and good things as things that you don't want. So it's not just an intellectual judgment. There's an aspect of a moral desire that's embedded in it which explains why people sin. They love sinning. They take great delight in sin. There's a reason why um, sins never go away, never uh, go out of fashion. You can always make money on these things because people will pay a lot of money. They place a high value on wicked things. So they are rejecting God's love and they are avail- that that's available to, to them. What is not available, they can't reject his will and they can't reject his power. That's going to take them. And they won't even want to anyway. They'll want to be where they are. So their, their souls have like a magnet that's, dra- you know, or, or iron that's dragging them towards a magnet. They want to be there. And they're, they're basically clamoring on the bank to get there, just like in Virgil. So they're desperate to go where they're meant to be. And he, no good soul ever takes his passage here. Therefore, if Sharon has complained of you, by now you can be sure what his words mean. What do his words mean if he's complaining that Dante is here? What do his words mean? And he's not dead yet. And he's not dead yet. So if he's complaining, well, then you're in a dream. You're not actually here. We're going to find at the end of the whole of the divine comedy that he, it's, a, it's been a big dream. So if Sean is unhappy that you're here because you're, you're not meant to be here, well, it's not, it's not only because you're not one of the damned, it's because you're still alive. And after this, the dark and plain quakes so tremendously, the memory of terror then bathes me in sweat again, a whirlwind burst out of the tear-drenched earth, a wind that crackled with a blood-red light, a light that overcame all of my senses, and like a man whom sleep has seized, I fell. So he falls as if dead, not slain in the spirit. Just. Falls down. Uh, in book four, he's in limbo. Now, in limbo, those, we have those who died before Christ or were not baptized. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but he is categorizing and explaining from a, the vantage point of Christian salvation, which is the whole organizing principle of life. Where do you, where do you stand in relation to Jesus Christ? That's the question everyone needs to ask. Where do you stand in relation to that? We will have the whole structure of the underworld and uh, the uh, purgatory and heaven. All of those things will be directed by that. The geography will be laid out based on those choices. And he will find class figures from the classical age here who possess wisdom, uh, the wisdom they always did, but they're cut off from the light of revelation. I can find line, line 69. I'm not sure. I'm gonna, it doesn't have the lines, unfortunately. I'll stop there for a minute. Um, and the light of revelation, it's in line 69 of your text. Um, I don't have it here on this. Um, the, li- the light of revelation is much brighter than conventional wisdom, the wisdom of the pagans. It's a different order of light. And we meet several of them. And who are they? Well, we have Homer, we have Horace, we have Ovid, we have Lucan. Four giant shades approaching us. In aspect, they were neither sad nor joyous. So they had the wisdom of their age, but they don't have the wisdom of God. They don't have the light of revelation of that. So they're neither nor. 
My kindly master then began by saying, look well at him who holds that sword in hand, who moves before the other three as Lord. That shade is Homer, the consummate poet. So there are four shades, giant shades. And the first and foremost is, is Homer. The second is Horus. The third is Ovid. The last is Lucan. Lucan's the only one I haven't mentioned at all here in the course. But because each of these spirits shares with me the name called out before by the lone voice, they welcome me and doing that do well. And so what is he? There will be six of them in total. Because Virgil is also one of their company and now Dante is. There are six of them down there. Dante is not going to stay there. But these are the company of the great poets who taught much wisdom. And uh, they will also then go to other uh, famous figures of the ancient world, Electra, Hector, Aeneas, Caesar. Note Aeneas from Virgil's Aeneid is here. He doesn't get out of this circle of limbo. As great as he was, he's here. Same with Caesar and other figures. Marcus Brutus, Brutus who drew, drew, drove Tarquin out, Lucretia, Julia, Marcia, Cornelia, Saladin. You see Saladin there. Saladin, the... Turkish Muslim emperor. You see Saladin there, nodding to the justice of that great Muslim leader. Puts even him there. Not quite a contemporary of Dante, but not that far off. So something from the um, Crusades, if you ever look up Saladin, he, he, he had a wonderful reputation in this age, and he sees others there, Socrates, Plato, Democritus, Diogenes, Empe Empedocles, Zenos, etc., etc., all sorts of famous, and now they go down to a part where no thing gleams. But here, a little bit of gleam, just a little bit, a little bit of light in the underworld where there is no, there is no light. And that will be in the fifth canto. Let me come to the fifth canto. Any questions about that? I'm going over this very quickly. So he goes from the first enclosure to the second circle, which is that of the lustful. And what we're going to see here in the punishment, uh, and it's, it's mentioned specifically a few cantos from now, is the way in which sins are punished, not just the way sins are ordered, but the way they're punished is also just. And it's, it's, a, it's a word in Italian called contrapasso. So the suffering is in accordance with the sin committed. It's contra, and they suffer, paso, in accordance with the action they committed, the evil action they committed. And so the lustful are flying around in space, in the air. They're out of control. They don't have control over their own bodies. They're being buffeted around in a whirlwind. Descriptions there in poetry often. People feel lifted up. They're blown around. They're out of control. I can't control myself. I can't help myself. I'm in, that's how they suffer here. They're in eternally in a whirlwind being thrown around. And it's a large space. So let me go back to this. I have not yet said anything about this. Um, you will note that in the inferno, the space shrinks as they go down space shrinks and so does there's another feature which is more surprising the inferno especially since it's called the inferno it's that the further down they go the colder it gets it gets more and more cramped and more and more cold at the bottom it's all ice and that's because dante's trying to teach us something about the on his understanding of physics in his day the relation of, well, just think about the relation of a solid to a liquid to air. Think of ice, right? Condensed water is ice. It's, it's cooled and so forth. But he's reflecting the understanding of physics of his day in the depiction of the underworld. He doesn't actually think in hell it's cold because in scripture it says that it's burning hot. He doesn't, he's not contradicting that. He is 
importing into it an understanding of physics, which goes along with the encyclopedic nature of knowledge that he's trying to present here. But he still calls it the inferno. So it's clearly allegorical. He doesn't mean it literally. He doesn't think that there is ice at the bottom of hell. But it, it's, it's a way of describing something he can't otherwise. He, I mean, he calls it the inferno, which suggests fire. But at, here it's icy. So hereafter in literature, in Western literature, when you get references to ice, it always suggests hell by a good writer at any rate. Ice and snow have entirely negative connotations. It's not just a reference to the fact that it's hard to live outside when it's cold in Canada or something like that. So snow means more than snow and ice means more than ice. It's a hellish landscape. Which is pretty easy to imagine when you're outside and it's minus 40 that, you know, I'm in hell. <laughs> But he doesn't mean it the way we associate it. It's for a different reason. So um, this little poem is often tr Did you have a question, by the way, or was it a comment? Yes, please. Um, I just wanted to clarify. When you said laughter, is he talking to Virgil? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, when he refers to, ver to master, here he, he is. Uh, speaking to Virgil. He's his guide, he is his teacher. He's getting it from Magister. Uh, an MA is a Master of Arts. A ma magister means, just means teacher. Right, so he's his teacher, he's his guide. He is able to lead him through the underworld because he understands these things even better than Dante does. Even though he's a pagan. Well, why wouldn't a pagan know about hell? Pagans are in hell. Of course he can teach him. And he knows all about virtue as well. So he is a great guide for him. And he, he's also a great poet. He follows him in that way. He's, so he's an exemplary figure. Uh, the fifth canto is often treated unto itself as a poem unto itself because it contains the legendary story of Paolo and Francesca. Uh, two lovers in particular are mentioned, and we spend a great deal of time on them, in the canto at any rate. They are presented just like Dido in Western literature as tragic lovers for whom we have great deal of sympathy. Dante create, evokes a sympathy in his audience, in his reader, in the same way that Virgil does in relation to Dido. Dido will also be mentioned here, by the way. But the sin of lust, uh, as we see it, is punished the least severely. From a worldly perspective, that's how it's going to be in the underworld. It's from the worldly perspective, the sin of lust is the most easy to understand. And so it's punished least severely. This is not from God's perspective. This is from man's perspective. And explicitly so. And here Dante encounters his own sins and experience there and connects himself with that. And I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a minute here. But um, love here is dissociated from divine love. It's just seen as its own good, its own end. I love you, I idolize you, I see you as the meaning and purpose of my whole life. I'm willing to die for you. This is how love poetry speaks. And it means it. I'm willing to die for love. In the ancient world, they have Venus presented as a goddess for a reason. Many people worship the goddess of love and, and understand their romantic loves out of a, a, a right proportion. And it leads them to follow their desires wherever they lead, and they're not willing to be checked. So they're out of control, just like Dido, uh, right? Who's willing to destroy her own kingdom, to have Aeneas. And, and Virgil said, this is madness to do such a thing. You need to do better, Aeneas, and you show how better you are than Dido by leaving her and going to found Rome. And he does it, and he doesn't want to do it. 
and he shows him himself to be a hero by doing what he didn't want to do, but because it was the right thing, he did it. That's heroic, says Virgil. We think that Dido's heroic because she was true to herself <laughs> and didn't contradict herself and is willing to go down to her death. That's not Virgil's judgment, and it's not Dante's judgment. That's the worldly judgment, which is a bad judgment. To, to idolize your own loves. That's what we will find here in the fifth canto. And we also find here, and this is interesting, a figure that I've not mentioned yet, uh, the figure of Minos. And Minos is a mythological beast who has a long tail and he wraps the tail around the sinner. And the number of times he wraps his tail around the sinner will lead the sinner to go down to the circle of hell that uh, corresponds to the number of times he wraps it. So if he wraps nine times, you're going down to the ninth circle. If it's just one, you're going to end up here, right with the lustful. So Minos is presented as a, a sort of demonic judge with a long tail. And as many times as Minos wraps his tail around himself, that marks the sinner's level. Always there is a crowd that stands before him. Each soul in turn advances toward that judgment. They speak and hear, then they are cast below. Arresting his extraordinary task, Minos, as soon as he had seen me, said, O oh, you who reached this house of suffering, be careful how you enter, whom you trust. The gate is wide, but do not be deceived. To which my guide replied, But why protest? Do not attempt to block his fated path. Our passage has been willed above where one can do what he has willed and ask no more. Now notes of desperations have begun to overtake my hearing. Now I come where mighty lamentation beats against me. I reach a place where every light is muted, which bellows like the sea beneath a tempest which, when it is battered by opposing winds. The hellish hurricane, which never rests, drives on the spirits with its violence, wheeling and pounding, it harasses them. When they come up against the ruined slope, then there are cries and wailing and lament, and there they curse the force of the divine. I learnt that those who undergo this punishment are damned because they sinned within the flesh, subjecting reason to the rule of lust. Remember, they've lost the good of the intellect. Well, here they subjected it to the rule of lust. Lust was their master, not God their lust. They let their bodies rule over their intellects. They lost within themselves. And another epic simile, and as in the cold season, starlings wing bear them along in broad and crowded ranks. So these are migratory birds. So does that blast bear on the guilty spirits. Now here, now there, now down, now up, it drives them. And there is no hope that ever comforts them. No hope for rest and none for lesser pain. And again, epic simile. And Dante is very curious here. And why is he curious? I've already told you in the first uh, lecture. Here he's dealing with the whole worldview of the courtly love poet. It's all centered around um, erotic love. And in particular, adulterous relationship. The whole uh, courtly love type of poetry, which Dante himself used to write and certainly to read, um, is filled with this canto from the world's perspective a very alluring and easy to uh, understand and hard to discredit lust. To this day, the lusts, these sorts of lusts are very difficult to stand against, not only personally, but to criticize others for them. We call judgmental and mean-spirited. And why are you saying it's so important when it seems something so right and it seems something so trivial? You're a small-minded person, right? That's the accusation. You're, you're petty, small-minded. Uh, the truth is that the person themselves thinks that it's that important that they will set aside all other things. So the small-minded person is the person that thinks their lusts are so important that they can't be spoken against. They've idolized it. They're the small-minded ones. Anyway. The first of those who are punished, whose history you want to know, once ruled as empress over many nations. Her vice of lust became so customary that she made license licit, that is legal in her laws, to free her from the scandal she had caused. 
This is Semiramis, of whom we read that she was Ninus's wife and his successor. She held the land the Sultan now commands, Sultan of Turkey. The other spirit killed herself for love, and she betrayed the ashes of Sicius. Who is this? It's Dido. The wanton Cleopatra follows next. So he's got a whole list of women, actually. And Helen, Helen of Troy. But also Achilles, who met, finally met love in his last battle. See, Paris, Tristan, and he lists all of these famous lovers that are being punished here. And no sooner had I heard my teacher name the ancient ladies and the knights, then pity sees me. And I was like a man astray. It's a great illustration. He's not being blown about by the wind, but he's like that because he has sympathy with the sin. He ought not to have sympathy with the sin. Maybe this is why he's down here. He's lost his way to begin with. Remember, he's, wa he's fallen from the path. He's gone off the path. My wor first words, poet, I should willingly speak with those two who go together there and seem so lightly carried by the wind. And he said to me, you'll see when they draw closer to us and then you may appeal to them by that love which impels them, they will come. So don't speak to them because they won't answer you, but talk about the love that they idolize and they will come because that's all they care about. And no sooner does he this, he calls this. And as doves, when summoned by desire, borne forward by their will, move through the air with wings uplifted still to their sweet nest, those spirits left the ranks where Dido suffers, approaching us through the malignant air, so powerful had been my loving cry. O oh, living being, gracious and benign, who through the darkened air have come to visit our souls that stain the world with blood, if he who rules the universe were friend to us, then we should pray to him to give you peace, for you have pitied our atrocious state. And then they tell the story. Well, the story of Paolo and Francesca is that Paolo and Francesca are brother and sister-in-law, and they're alone. Uh, Paolo's brother is away. His brother's wife is there with him. They are reading a book. And what is the book that they're reading? It's the story of Lance Lancelot and Guinevere. A story of a, a courtly love story in which Guinevere, the wife of the king, commits adultery with one of King Arthur's knights, his best night, in fact. And the whole of Camelot comes down as a consequence of this, this betrayal. So it's not just any old adulterous affair. It brings down a whole kingdom as a consequence. But still, this is what she's reading. One day came to pass, we read of Lancelot, how love had overcome him. We were alone and we suspected nothing. And time and time again, that reading led our eyes to meet and our, made our faces pale. And yet one point alone defeated us. When we had read how the desired smile was kissed by one who was so true a lover, this one who never shall be parted from me while all his body trembled kissed my mouth. A Galaho indeed, that book, and he who wrote it too. That day we read no more. A Galaho, the word Galaho means a, a panderer, a betrayer, somebody who deceived them. It's not a reference to a person, it's a reference to the book. The book is what brought them to kiss one another. It wasn't even the person beside them. The book seduced them into thinking that the adulterous affair was something that they ought to admire and emulate. And once they've been deceived, they act upon it, and that's the end. But the reference is to the book. And at these words, Dante fell as a dead body falls. Why does Dante fall here? Dante, not Virgil, Dante. No? He's led others astray through his writing. 
He's a Galaho. He's not committed the sin. He's not, he's not had an adulterous affair. That's not what he's confessing. If he's that and it's unrepented, then he's, he's going to be here it, it himself. He's not here, but he's led others to be here by presenting a, a adulterous relationship as something they should desire. He's seduced them by a falsehood. And so he falls as a dead body falls. He's, he's guilty. That's how I read this, at any rate. There's a sort of a symbolic death. This is the sin of which he's guilty. He, fall, he falls here because of what he wrote. Now, because of that, you can take something. I'm not going to spend much time on this, but you can take something about what Dante regards as the uh, duty of an artist then not to lead people to sinful conduct. There, it, there's a a duty as a teacher. You ought to make people better, not worse. Uh, this has almost wholly been lost sight of in um, Western art now. The, the duty of the artist to lead people towards virtuous conduct and good character rather than simply entertaining them. And by entertaining them, I mean appealing to their worst nature because almost all art appeals to people's worst nature now, including pornography of violence and so forth, which in the, even in the Greek world, pagan world, they didn't even show it on stage. The violence was off stage. When Oedipus plucks out his eyes, he goes off stage and comes back. We see that he's done it. We know what's happened, but we don't see it. We're not caught up in the lust of the flesh that actually delights in gory violence. let alone pornography on stage and so forth, which is so much part of our, our filmmaking and so forth now. But even aside from the visual imagery, which is problematic enough, just the depiction of, of wicked actions as being understandable and uh, the people that would disagree with it as being mean-spirited or small-spirited, this is also wicked. It's false teaching. And Dante is effectively a, a form of a false teacher here. That's why he falls. Yes. He doesn't fall every level. This is the only one he falls. He fell earlier, right? When, uh, right, right away. But that's because he's entering hell. Right. That was he first going to hell, and oh, pff, you know, lose my senses. It's so bad. But this one he falls because he's connected to the sin. He's not falling again. Just to let you know, this is the last fall that Dante takes. And it's for a different reason. There it's because he's first is he's entering hell. Here it's because he identifies with that sin. He's compassionate towards it. Uh, we've just seen that. He calls out to them. This, these two really appeal to me. I'm very interested in these two. Well, those two were very interested in courtly love. So much so that they acted upon their desires. And you, Dante, wrote poetry that would have encouraged this sort of thing. And look where it's landed them. So there's an, uh, I'm guilty. Uh, let me move on. So that's the fifth canto. I can't remember what other cantos I had you read them. What did I prescribe here? Eight. Okay. In the eighth canto, we have finally reached the city of Dis. So now we're finally in a city. Uh, there it is, the walls of Dis. Sixth circle where the heretics are and the violence come with it. It's, so note how heresy is connected with violence. And different types of um, transgressions each of which is worse than the other. Transgressions against your neighbor, against yourself, and against God. But the eighth canto, the city of death, is, is an obstruction. There are fallen angels that guard the gate. There are also th three furies 
there, which we saw in Virgil's Underworld as well. These are demonic beasts. Um, and there's also a head. The head of Medusa is here that turns men to stone. And it demonstrates for us as he goes down. By the way, the city of Dis is around line 70. I don't have the line numbers here, but so... about the gates. There we go. The entrance is there. More than a thousand who once had reigned from heaven and they cried in anger, who is this who without death can journey through the kingdom of the dead? These are the fallen angels. There's a thousand of them down there. How on earth can he get down there? They're angry. And my wise master made a sign that said he wanted to speak secretly to them. Then they suppressed somewhat their great disdain and said, you come alone. Let him be gone. For he was reckless entering this realm. Let him return alone on his mad road. Or try to if he can, since you, his guide, cross so dark a land. You are to stay. These are the fallen angels that say, let him be on his own. Imagine, consider, reader, my dismay before the sound of those abominable words. Returning here seems so impossible. Oh, my dear guide, who more than seven times has given back to me my confidence and snatched me from deep danger that had managed, do not desert me when I am so undone. And if they will not let us pass beyond, let us retrace our steps together quickly. These were my words. The Lord who led me there replied, forget your fear. No one can hinder our passage. One so great has granted it. So it's nothing to do with the courage of Virgil or the courage of Dante. It's been willed by, from above. So nobody can stop this. And we see that what one of the, the great dangers here is uh, that Dante himself expresses is that he can forget that he is not intended for hell. He's, it's, it's easy when you're being charged by so many figures um, here to forget that he is called by God. And there's a madness that seizes him. So down he goes through the city of Dis. And it, it affects him and he finds it extraordinarily difficult to carry on because of his disorientation. In Canto 9, he's still buffeted um, by a loss of courage. Virgil stood alert, line four, like an attentive listener, because his eye could hardly journey far across the black air and heavy fog. We have to win this battle, he began. If not, but one so great had offered help. How slow that someone's coming to see me. But I saw well enough how he had covered his first words with the words that followed after, so different from what he had said before. Nonetheless, his speech made me afraid because I drew out from his broken phrase a meaning worse, perhaps, than he intended. Uh, he will go down here, and uh, what did I want to draw reference to? There's a, a serpent and a wand that refer to a golden bow. Let me skip over that, because I realized I want to go to the end of this as well. When I say the end, I mean the, of the inferno. That's part of my task today. Uh, let's just go to 34. Note the commentary. The anti-spiration of unlove freezes the icy core of the universe. Lucifer is there. Lucifer, the bearer of light, the most beautiful of created things, betrays his creator and becomes the ugliest of things. Contrapasso. Uh, here we find ourselves at the bottom of the inferno. I've skipped over so much here. Um, but here we're in the realm of the traitors. There are other ways of seeing this. Uh, that might be it. Oh, honestly. Do I have to sign up? I do have to sign up. Okay, for just forget it. Not worth it. Everybody has a sign up thing. 
uh, we have at the bottom of the inferno uh, great traitors. One of them is obvious, it's Judas Iscariot, who betrays the Lord. But we also have uh, traitors to, uh, that are just famous in the ancient pagan world. One of them is Brutus, who, who stabs Julius Caesar. Now, Julius Caesar, in some traditions, and in fact, in the English-speaking world's tradition, Julius Caesar is a tyrant, and Brutus, who stabs him, is a Republican freedom fighter. That's not Dante's understanding. He's the betrayer of the um, founder of the Roman Empire. Or he's a betrayer of the one who will adopt Augustus Caesar and bring about the Roman Empire, which will become the Holy Roman Empire. So it's just another instance of betrayal. Depends on who, who you're reading on these things and the perspective taken. But for here, we have uh, in the figure of Brutus uh, a very wicked man. And then we, fi we find that there's a third as well. What's the third man uh, that we find? Cassius. Um, and all three of these men, do we have that in the picture? Uh, sort of. We don't really have a very good job of it. We have uh, at the bottom encased in ice, uh, Satan himself, and he has wings, and the wings are flapping, and with the flapping wings, the, the ice, the icy air, the blast of it goes upwards and makes everything above him cold. But he's encased in ice, and he's encased in ice up to his waist. And he has three heads and three mouths, and in the three mouths are the bodies of the three traitors. So they're being munched on eternally, and their backs are being flayed by claws. Yeah, it's, it's not a pretty picture. So there he is. Lucifer. If he was once as handsome as he now is ugly, and despite that, raised his brows against his maker, one can understand how every sorrow has its source in him. I marveled when I saw that. On his head, he had three faces. One in front, blood red. And then another two that just above the midpoint of each shoulder joined the first. So there's a head up here, and then there are two beneath, like a triangle. And at the crown, all three were reattached. The right looked somewhat yellow, somewhat white. The left, like those who come from where the Nile descending flows, so it's a little bit brown. And then finally, um, we saw the blood red one at one. And beneath each face, two wings spread out, as broad as suited, so immense a bird. I'd never seen a ship with sails so wide. They had no feathers, but were fashioned like a bat's. And he was agitating them so that three winds made their way out of him. And all Caucasus, that is the river down there, is frozen. And he weeps out of his six eyes, does the devil. And down his three chins, tears gushed together with a bloody froth. Within each mouth, he used it like a grinder. With gnashing teeth, he tore to bits a sinner, so that he brought much pain to three at once. The forward sinner found that biting nothing when matched against the clawing, for at times his back was stripped completely of its height. Now, this is like the punishments that are given to the giants in the underworld of Virgil. It's that they, uh, all the flesh that's been ripped from their back grows back, and then the same thing again and again. Eternal punishment. And, he, and, and, and actually, Dante repeatedly makes references to the... Uh, epics that talk about punishments and the repeated recurrence of punishments eternally. And that soul that suffers most is Judas Iscariot. His head inside, he jerks his leg without. Those other, t their heads beneath, the one who hangs from the black snout is Brutus. See how he writhes and does not say a word. The other who seems so robust is Cassius. Okay, but the night has come again. Now remember I said it started on Good Friday and now it's about to move to Saturday. So they have to get through here because they have a passage. They have to be in paradise come Easter Sunday. When the sun rises, they have to be there. So they are on a quick three-day journey. And it is now nighttime. And he says, 
I clasped him around the neck and he watched for the, cha the chance of time and place and when the wings were open wide enough. Okay, so the wings are beating and as I say, the not Satan, uh, Eh, that's not going to work. That's not bad. I don't want to watch the video. Anyway, encased in ice, his, his wings go out, and as they go out, then Virgil goes down. They want to get down to the bottom. And to get down to the bottom, they have to pass down through a crack in the ice. The crack in the ice is at the crack in his buttocks. So he's got to pass down through Satan's backside to get into the place where he needs to go. It's not a, it's not a pleasant journey at the bottom of hell, right there. It's frozen in the ice, nice. So there's a place where the ice is not totally inclined and they have to go down through there, so nice. And they climb up, they're climbing down the shaggy sides. He's got hair on his back. Pulling down, going down, going down, comes out. And what happens down the shaggy tufts between the tangled hair and icy crust? We reach the point at which the thigh revolves just above the swelling at the hip. My guide with heavy strain and rugged work reversed his head to where his legs had been and grappled on the hair as one who climbs. I thought that we were going back to hell because he's reversing course suddenly. Hold tight, my master said. He panted like a man exhausted. It is by such stairs that we must take our leave of so much evil. Then he slipped through a crevice in a rock, placed me on the edge of it to sit, and that done, he climbed toward me with steady steps. I raised my eyes, believing I should see the half of Lucifer that I'd left, so the, the wings and the head. Instead, he sees two wings, or two legs sticking up in the air. Upright, how's that possible? Because up is down and down is up. He's flipped around on the other side of the world. So, again, Dante, Inferno. It'll work. Works well enough. At the top of this, see Dante and Virgil there, the vestibule, and they go down through limbo and down to Lucifer at the bottom, but then they come to the other side. The other side at the top of this, you might have noticed, I showed it at the beginning, it has the heavenly Jerusalem there. And Jerusalem, it's within the, Inside the Dome of the Rock. You know what the Dome of the Rock is? This is, explore my options. I don't want to explore my options. Oh, would you get lost? It's so terrible. Anyway, inside this, do you know what the outside of the Dome of the Rock is? This place, you ever seen this? Jerusalem? It's now a Muslim mosque, right? But inside that is a rock, right in the middle of it. And what's the rock? It's the rock in which Abraham, the legend goes, let, the Abraham led Isaac up to, to sacrifice him. It's also, and again, I think this is Jewish myth and legend, but it's said to be on the, a stopper on the mouth of hell. So the idea is that Satan and his fallen angels hit the earth right there and go down into the earth and push the earth. All the displaced earth, when they hit and fall from heaven, they go down and bang, the earth gets pushed down and it gets pushed out the other side There it is, to a mountain. The mountain of the displaced earth comes out the other side, and it's 
in the South Pole, as it were. Here's the North Pole, it hits there, or actually it's not the North Pole, it's Jerusalem, but whatever's on the other side of the Earth from that, Mount Purgatory is on the other side of the Earth from the displaced Earth. Now, obviously Dante doesn't think that this is literally how it is, but it has a figurative meaning for him. It has an allegorical meaning. And we're going to find next time we'll go to Mount Purgatory, the different types of sin that he needs to overcome to ascend towards paradise. These are the sins that, that can bring you down to hell and keep you down in hell. Here are the types of sins that you will have to overcome that will, uh, you will have to overcome to climb up to paradise. But that's where he is right now. He is now on the other side of hell and it seems upright. Suddenly it was upright before and it's upright again because he's passed through the earth. He's not in Australia. But he is wherever the opposite of Jerusalem, 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 Jerusalem is on the other side of the earth. Okay, anyway, I'm done for now.